Hey bag maker, today I'm going to be talking about the misting bottle, various fabrics that I've added to my stash. The book review will be for a book called DIY Guide to Tie-Dye Style and I'll be demonstrating how to press a finished bag. Thanks, I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness. Thanks so much for watching Social Sunday, my weekly sewing chat. Hey everyone, happy Sunday and welcome to Social Sunday. I see Joyce is watching, Wendy from Pennsylvania, Gloria from Tennessee, and Linda from New York City. So welcome to the show, whether you're watching live or if you're watching the recording later on in the week. A friendly reminder before I get started, just about everything that I talk about during Social Sunday are things that I've purchased myself. So these are not things that I'm getting paid to talk to you about but just cool things that I found that I'd like to share with you. And everything that I'm scheduled to talk about, I link to in the description. So if you're interested in finding out more about any of the books, fabrics, notions, or projects that I talk about during Social Sunday, just check that link in the description and you can find out more information there. So the notion of the week this week is uh, this misting bottle. Lately, I've been seeing a lot of people on social media and also some friends using a misting bottle and I thought what's the difference between a misting bottle and just a regular spray bottle um, this is mainly used for um, spray starching fabric or when you're ironing fabrics to get everything um, smoothed out in preparation for attaching the fabrics to interfacing and starting to sew with it so I'm going to have Danny switch to the overhead camera and I've got this scrap of fabric over here this is I chose a red fabric because based on past history, I feel like when I'm spraying liquids on red fabrics, the, the color kind of changes and the, the liquid really shows up. So this is just uh, quilting cotton. It's a Kona solid. Here's what the missing bottle looks like up close. It's a little bit different from, here's my best press bottle, which is a spray bottle. Um, and most spray bottles will be similar. So. The difference, the, the first initial difference is with a spray bottle, you're generally kind of pumping up and down over here at this little lever. For the misting bottle, instead of pumping, you're just holding it down and it will continuously spray. So um, I do have best press inside the misting bottle. Um, I have a gallon of it actually, and so I just filled it with the best press, but um, you could also fill it with the liquid of your choice, water, um, if you like using um, a different spray starch or I think I've heard in the past I haven't tried this personally that some people like to put a mixture of water with a little bit of vodka in their um, spray bottles for uh, spraying fabric so um, I'm going to first spray again the liquids in both are the same I'm going to spray first with the traditional spray bottle the fabric and I think you'll be able to see um, what the coverage looks like just because it's uh, the spray bottle is very uh, apparent. So as I'm spraying, you can see um, the little droplets of the liquid. I'm going to go ahead and turn my iron on real quick just to uh, get this dried off really quick. So as you can see, it's uh, the coverage is uh, spotty, I guess is the, liter the literal word. Actually, let me flip this over to my non-sprayed half. So I'm now I'm going to use the, the misting bottle. So I was a little uh, dubious before I started using it, but um, there we go. It was a little too close on that other end, but as you can see, it's sort of uh, more of an even coating rather than uh, little beads of color. I was really close over here. Um, that's why that's a little bit darker, but um, I kind of, I've been working on a lot of quilts lately, so I kind of liked the more even coverage because I guess I didn't realize when I was using a traditional bottle that um, it just wasn't covering every single area of the fabric. And when I was, it was a little bit more noticeable when I actually cut out the, the fabrics for my quilt blocks because um, the fabrics that were evenly starched, uh, they do feel different than fabrics that had maybe half as much starch or very little or no starch. So um, I suppose, the coverage is more important for quilt making, but I also like it for bags because sometimes I pull, I don't know if you have the same issue, sometimes I pull a fabric out of my stash that has lots of folds or perhaps I 
was really hasty folding the fabric and putting it back on the shelf and there's a bunch of creases or even if it was the end of the bolt has lots of folds and creases in it and um, I like keeping a spray by my ironing board um, to get those trouble spots out before I attach it to the interfacing because I find it's usually easier getting all those creases out before attaching to the interfacing rather than after. So Janet says, where can we buy that missing bottle? We actually have it on our website. Uh, we have, uh, I hope, plenty in stock. Um, uh, yeah, link is in the description if you're interested in viewing the mis missing bottle on our site. So I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments, do you keep a spray at your ironing board? If you do, what kind? Maybe you just use water. Um, Flatter is another brand of um, it's actually a starch alternative spray. Um, it's made by the company called Soak. So that's another alternative. Um, as you saw, I had my best press over here. I've used flatter and best press over the years. I, I seem to kind of alternate. Um, and I do like the, uh, they both come in lots of different scents. This particular one I have right now is uh, scent free. So um, yesterday morning I made, I haven't baked anything in a little while. I made a recipe that I've made a few times in the past. Um, it's called, I'm not sure how I came across this recipe, but the recipe is called Elvis Presley's Favorite Pound Cake. <laughs> Danny's going to put a picture up on the screen. Um, you know, here's the picture of, obviously it looks like pound cake, but it's really, really good. Probably one of the best pound cakes I've ever had, which is why I make it over and over. I've linked to the recipe in the description in case you're interested in checking that out. It makes a rather large, um, I used a bundt pan for mine, um, it makes a rather large cake so I'm probably going to um, freeze at least half of the cake um, and save it for another time but it's really good. I happen to have some blueberries on hand, it's really good with um, some fresh fruit so uh, enjoy that if you're interested in a pound cake recipe. And I've got a bunch of fabrics that I've added to my stash recently, I'm gonna move some of these things out of the way. All right, Danny's going to switch back to the overhead camera and I'm going to share my new fabric find. So this one's from Timeless Treasures. Um, I, I really liked the paint splatter, bright colors. Not sure what I'll make with this yet. Maybe, maybe a, a backpack. Seems like it might be good for something like that. And I, this one I have, I had to get it, but I really have no idea what I'll make with it. Uh, this one's from Alexander Henry. And uh, yeah, I just really liked the bright, fun colors. Um, as you probably know, I love hummingbirds and I picked this next one up, uh, sort of a border print. And I like the, I'm just now noticing the um, positive notes on the, um, positive text rather on the hummingbird's body. I kind of like the collage effect, especially in the wings. This is another one, kind of sim not exactly similar to the first, but I guess the same theme. Uh, I liked the pastel colors. I just thought it would work with a lot of different types of bags, especially perhaps paired with some, some cork. And then the last fabrics are all from Heather Ross's um, West Hill, I guess reprint, um, if you could say that. So these fabrics, I bought a few years ago um, because I loved the theme of the horses, which you'll see some, some more horse fabrics in a minute. Um, but Heather Ross designs a lot of, um, I guess, whimsical prints. I remember years ago she had um, lines of pajamas over at Target and uh, people were, and I, again, this was years ago, but people were buying the pajamas and cutting them up and selling the bits of fabric online. So. I do have a lot of little itty bitty scraps of Heather Ross in my stash. And then there's just a couple more. Again, the, the theme of the fabric line is uh, a little bit of horses and this last fabric from the line is little girls playing with their plastic model horses, which I have a bunch of, even though I'm not a little girl anymore. So all of the fabrics I've linked to in the description. Um, and I have another question for you. Um, what type of fabric do you use most often? It, it could be for bag making or otherwise. Um, maybe it's quilting cotton. Maybe you use a lot of either leather or vinyl on your bags. 
let me know in the comments what type of substrate or type of fabric that you're using most often. So I was looking at this um, backpack that I had in my closet. Um, I don't know if you can understand this sentiment, but when I was little, I would often hoard gifts. Like I remember getting books of stickers or stationery or um, nice letter writing papers. And instead of using them, I would sort of, they were just too beautiful to use, so I would save them. So I came across this backpack in my closet, um, this Park Sling backpack that I made a few years ago when the pattern first came out. I made this with backstitch fabrics and some um, Moda grunge. And here's here's a look at the, the back of the backpack. But when I saw, when it, obviously I see this backpack every day because it's in my closet where my clothes are, but it sort of reminded me of when I was a kid hoarding those stickers and notepads and stationery. I've never used this. I've just kept it in my closet nice and pristine. So um, I'm thinking maybe this is the year I should start using it because uh, to be honest, working so hard on things, while they may be pretty, um, they should be used and enjoyed. So um, yeah, make sure you make sure you use your, your hand handmade items or um, you know, stickers or what have you, um, rather than um, saving them for a rainy day, I suppose. Uh, so Danny's favorite part of the show when he's not on it, we'd like to invite all of the bag makers to stand proud. Let us know in the comments that you're part of the So Sweetness squad. Danny and I are both so happy that you have tuned in for the show and we really appreciate your support so much. So um, thank you so much for tuning in. So the book review for this week is, um, I guess sort of a combined sewing and dyeing book. Um, Danny's gonna switch to the overhead camera. The book is called DIY Guide to Tie-Dye Style, um, The Basics and Way Beyond. So um, I have dyed fabrics in the past and Violet and I have also dyed some actual tie-dye t-shirts. So I saw this book and I thought I wanted to check it out because um, I was hoping there would be something inside the book that was new to me. So obviously the beginning of just about every craft book is the basics, dyes and supplies that you'll need to make the projects in the book. And there's a whole ton of projects in the book. I just bookmarked a few rather than go through every single one. Um, but the, the next section of the book is binding techniques, basically um, how to get different looks based on where you're putting your rubber bands. So I bookmarked my favorite one over here. I really love this sun flare. As you can see, different designs, um, and they show you step by step with photos how to get each of the designs. And then I'll show you a few of the projects. Like I said, I haven't bookmarked all of them, um, but I bookmarked the ones that use different techniques such as reverse dye, which is shown over here in this particular project. Um, ice dye, which I've never done before, but I really love the bright colors and I love the, um, I guess, monochromatic look of the skirt, like the different shades of the pink in, in this uh, particular project. Pastel dye, which, um, looks really great, especially on these sweatshirts. Um, something interesting to try. This one was the most fun that I came across in this book, using shaving cream and dye to color. They colored sneakers, but obviously you could use this shaving cream method for other things. And I like the um, really light echoes of color in the shoes. Also discussed in the book is using natural dyes. Um, in this project, they made scrunchies, but using natural dyes from things like avocado pits, turmeric, they use hibiscus tea packets. So there's a lot of different things that you can use if you're interested in trying out something from the pantry. And then this one's reverse dye. This looks awesome. And this is probably the project that I'd like to try out most in, in the book. Um, I think for me, my interest would mostly be in perhaps dyeing fabric for use in a bag. Um, so there's lots of other really neat projects and instructions in the book. Um, but just, I don't know, I guess I never really thought about tie-dye having so many uses and um, this is clearly illustrated in the book. So if you're interested in checking out more, um, I've linked to this book in the description. And um, yeah, check it out if you're interested in tie-dye. So. My demonstration for tonight, let me get my iron going. 
I had an email recently asking if I would demonstrate how to press a finished bag. So um, I've assembled a few bags from the stash uh, to demonstrate a few different techniques. And some of the ironing techniques may vary depending on the style of, your, of the bag that you're working with. But um, I tried to pull a few different styles such as um, a bag that's fully enclosed with a zipper top, a box style bag. And so um, Danny's going to switch um, to the overhead camera and I'll start working through some of the techniques. So you'll want to do this on the end of your ironing board because I can't fit my ironing board on set. I'm using this uh, totally tubular pressing station that I demonstrated on a previous show. Um, I've got my iron set at the cotton setting and I'll start with this method will be good for either a bag with that closes with a flap, basically the top is opened, or I've pulled out the Clyde Bank tote over here because um, this one I can zip up. So basically a bag where you have access to uh, the top edge of the bag when the bag is finished. So I'm going to go ahead and slide this. Again, this, this will simulate the end of your ironing board. And I'm just going to go ahead and press my iron. Um, I've got some cork on this particular bag, so I'm going to avoid cork, but I'll talk about pressing cork um, in just a minute. So you can press the outside. I also like to press the inside, which I can remove my pressing station to do that. So to press the inside, it's important to press the lining also so things look nice and flat before you start putting things um, in your finished bag. And my top tip for pressing a finished bag, especially if the bag has cork or vinyl in it, is to use Wonder Clips. And if you've never done this before, I suggest testing a small area of the bag first because um, Wonder Clips can leave sort of a little indentation. I don't know if you can see those two little dots in the Wonder Clip, but it can leave sort of an indentation in the bag um, temporarily um, give it an hour or so and those little indentations will go away but what I like to do in the finished bag is I like to work my way around the entire bag and attach wonder clips to all the areas where there's a seam so um, that would be for this particular bag the whole bottom area I would just put wonder clips around the entire bottom edge so I'm gonna go ahead and start attaching them there. If you happen upon a very, very thick area where it seems like a regular Wonder Clip won't hold, you can use, instead of the regular Wonder Clips, they make Jumbo Wonder Clips as well. Um, I'm not sure why that one's not green. Normally the Jumbo, Jumbo Wonder Clips are have green on the top, so you can use those instead if you prefer, but I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, work my way around the rest of the bag. Yeah, this particular bag doesn't have a lot of seams, but I'm going to swap out to a different bag in just a minute. So what you want to do with the Wonder Clips, you want to just leave them in place for an hour or two, and then you can go ahead and remove them, and the Wonder Clips sort of finger press that area for you. So an alternative to the Wonder Clips, of course, is using the regular iron to press this area. So what I would suggest doing is, this is the bottom of the bag. I sort of first take my fingers and kind of smooth everything out. And then I take my iron and just sort of glide it over those areas. Again, I'm not going to get close to the area where the cork is because um, I don't want my iron to touch the cork. Um, same goes with leather or vinyl. Um, but that's why the Wonder Clips are really great because you don't, um, you can get a nice pressing um, without having the iron um, touch the fabric. So another style of type of a bag is sort of a bag with a boxy finish such as this Brumby pouch. This is from Minikin season um, three. So I pressed this one previously but I'm going to show you um, how I would suggest pressing any type of box type either pouches or bags. Um, so first um, the corners where the seams intersect I'm just going to go ahead and sort of First, run my fingers over the area. Again, you can use that method with the Wonder Clips if you'd prefer, or you can use your iron. Same thing on the bottom of the bag. I'm just gonna go ahead and take my fingers and kind of flatten everything out first. And then if you're using your iron for this, you can go ahead and just run your iron over. And you'll do that for all, basically, four edges. So top and bottom, and I'm going to pinch the sides as well and give that a good press. 
So for normal pressing, I use my ironing board. Um, on set, I'm using this um, wool mat. It's a half inch thick and it's really good for um, kind of keeping heat reflecting back toward my project. If you're making a bag that has mostly vinyl or cork on the outside of the bag, an option for pressing it instead of using your iron, since you really can't do that, and if you'd like to skip your wonder clips, another option is to heat up just an area on your ironing board that's big enough to accommodate the bag. So again, instead of heating up the whole ironing board, you're just heating up a, a good sized area to get the whole front and back of the bag on the board. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to unzip, here's my bag over here, this is the Renegade bag. Um, so I'm going to just slide my hands inside and I'm going to run it back and forth a few times and you want to do this immediately after you heat up your ironing board, but I'm going to run the bag back and forth a few times on um, that heated spot. And you might need to do this more than once, but it's a good way to um, press things that can't be pressed with the iron, such as uh, clear vinyl is uh, another culprit for something like that. So um, that's another good option there. And um, I think one more thing that I wanted to show is, where's my clapper? Um, you can also use a wooden clapper. So I like this particular wooden clapper from the Gypsy Quilter because um, it's nice and on the small side. I've had some other clappers in the past where my fingers kind of had a hard time reaching around and certainly it felt um, kind of a strain reaching around a bigger clapper. So this one's on the smaller side. What a clapper does is because it's made of wood, it absorbs um, moisture from your iron. So when you're using your iron, you'll use seam and the wooden clapper absorbs the moisture and the weight of the clapper kind of helps press the seam or the edge of the bag at the same time. So I've I pull, I pulled a third bag. This is the coalition bag and I'm going to show you how to press the bottom edge of the bag with the clapper. So all right, what I'm going to do, you can either iron directly on top of the area that you're pressing or you can just hit it with some seam. So since I've already showed how to iron on a certain area, I'll just hit this particular edge with some seam so my iron's not actually touching it. And then you want to immediately take the clapper and hold it on the area. And this works really great for quilt blocks as well. So you'll just work your way around all of the, the edges of the bag that you would like to press. And as you can see, this um, looks quite crisp, at least from the initial pressing. So a clapper is a really great option to have in your um, bag making toolkit as well. So um, hope you hope you enjoyed that quick demonstration showing a few different methods for pressing. Um, perhaps you have a different method that I haven't discussed. Go ahead and drop that in the comments right now. But I think pressing the finished bag is really important. I know we all get excited as soon as we pull the bag off the sewing machine and want to photograph it and let all our friends know. Or if you're in our Sew Sweetness Facebook group, let everyone in the group know uh, that you finished a bag and show off your picture. But pressing is really important because it gives that bag that last final professional look. Um, and I think it's definitely worth the extra effort to um, press the bag really well um, before you start showing it off. So um, I'm going to be answering some questions live in just a minute. So if you have a question for me, let me know in the comments. It can be either a bag making question, question about a notion or a tool, um, or a general sewing question. You can type that in the comments on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you watch our show live. So Danny's going to start putting some of those up on the screen. And stay tuned for the end of the show um, for, a, for another giveaway. Um, Patricia says, I think I use less product when I use the misting bottle and get better results. That's a great comment. I actually didn't even think about the part about using less product, but uh, it totally makes sense because obviously it's misting instead of spraying, uh, which would be more uh, liquid coming out. Mary says, what is the difference what is the difference between Mary Ellen's and Flatter? So from what I understand, the Mary Ellen's best press is um, an actual clear starch um, and Flatter, which is made by the company Soak. I believe Flatter is a starch alternative spray. Um, besides that, I don't, I don't know what those uh, two things mean exactly, but 
Um, I feel like they both do a really good job for pressing and getting more of a substantial feel to uh, your fabrics, especially before quilting. Linda says, um, Sarah, do you ever use a tailor's clapper? Um, I actually do have a couple of them, um, I think hidden away somewhere in the sewing room, but um, I've used them in the past, but I guess kind of sparingly. Gina says, will ironing cork ruin it? So I wouldn't recommend letting your iron touch the actual cork fabric. Um, this white portion over here and the straps um, on this particular bag are cork. Um, I recommend um, if you do need to iron it on the wrong side of the fabric, do so sparingly and use a pressing cloth. Um, but I prefer to just keep the cork rolled up and uh, finger press it instead while I'm working with it um, rather than using the heat from the iron. Karen says, how does the Pellon PLF 36 that you just started carrying in your shop compare to SF 101? That's a really good question. The main difference is um, that Pellon PLF 36 is a non-woven interfacing and Pellon SF101, which is also known as ShapeFlex, is a woven interfacing. So I started carrying that PLF 36 because I have a few projects in the works that use it. Um, the main reason or the main reason that I decided to pick it up is because it works really well when working with um, pockets such as credit card slots in a wallet or anytime you're working with um, something on the bias like a diagonally cut pocket that really stabilizes the area so that it doesn't look uh, kind of wavy in the finished bag if that makes sense um, so um, yeah in future you'll be seeing more um, sprinkled in here and there a few projects using the PLF uh, 36. Linda says, what is the best way to attach a crossbody strap to a Bellevue pouch? pouch? Um, should I make fabric loops and use D-rings on the pouch? That's a great question. Um, the Bellevue pouch is basically front and back fabric, so you have a side seam. So I wonder if um, it might look nice with a d-ring on the front and the d-ring on the back to attach the strap um, perhaps either attached in the seam where you attach the zipper or maybe made with a fabric tab on the front and the back so it can be kept out of the seam um, i guess those are my two initial thoughts for that particular project karen says what is the gold gray and yellow bag behind you um, over your left shoulder left shoulder Oh, um, this is the Stingray bag. It comes in two different sizes. Uh, this is the shoulder bag size, and it also comes in a bigger size, which is the tote bag size. And the fabric that I used for this bag is designed by Tim Holtz. Carol says, do you ever use those mini irons for bag pressing? Oh, you know, I wrote it on my outline, and I forgot to mention, um, mini irons are also great for sticking inside the finished bag so you can get some pressing in in your lining so some of the bigger bags you can actually use uh, your regular sized iron to place on the inside but some of the smaller projects the mini iron would be really great for um, pressing the inside especially the bottom of the bag linda uh, linda says how do you press the inside of the bags uh yeah so let's see let me grab this coalition bag. I don't think my table is high enough. I guess I'll, I'll simulate pressing on the inside of the bag because I have to hold it up. Um, actually, let me try using this. There we go. Okay, so for the inside of the bag, if you want to press the bottom, you can take your iron or mini iron, depending on the size of the bag, and you can actually just stick it inside. And I've actually got my iron touching the bottom of the bag. There we go. Um, for pressing something that isn't the bottom, such as the lining, if you'd like to press that on the front and the back of the bag, and just go ahead and slip that on the inside. Again, this will depend on uh, the size of the bag, the shape of the bag, and how easily you can get your iron on the inside. Janet says, do you have a video on types of threads for bag making? I actually don't because I really just use Aurifil 40 weight thread, but 
Um, I'll write that on my list for a future demonstration. Um, Jackie says, haven't used my Juki 2010Q in over six months. Should I oil it before using it again? My initial thought would be yes. Obviously, you can always check with your sewing machine technician first, but um, yeah, six months doesn't seem that long. Um, I was thinking of tune-ups, but I, I would say a tune-up for a sewing machine maybe every year, every year and a half. Um, it's been a while since I've got mine tune up, tuned up, so they definitely do need to go in. And the tune-up is basically just maintenance um, that can help catch small issues before they become big issues. Um, Diana says, why not use an inseam tab on the side with a D-ring or a triangle ring like the day trip cell phone case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea as well, having a little tab um, instead of having it in the, the actual fabric and in the seam. Um, Wendy says, what bag would the Mustang purse organizer fit into? Um, you know what, I've not personally um, test fit uh, the two sizes of the Mustang purse in all of the So Sweetness bags, but the dimensions of the finished purse organizers are in the pattern. So um, if you have trouble deciding which So Sweetness project it should go in, um, either the petite or the regular size, you can always email me. Chances are I have that particular pattern still because sometimes I give my So Sweetness bags that I've sewn a away or as gifts but I do keep a lot of them in the basement in case they ever need to come out for a demonstration um, like I did for tonight. Lori says, I leave my clips on my seams for a day or so and that really does a job, does a great job. Yeah, the Wonder Clips, I don't know when I started using the Wonder Clips to hold the seams, but um, yeah, you're right, it does a fantastic job and sometimes I'll just skip the ironing altogether and just use uh, straight Wonder Clips on all the seams. Deborah says, do you have any suggestions for pressing the fabric portion of a finished bag that has areas of the vinyl? Um, yeah, um, you'll want to heat up a spot on your ironing board like I showed with my wool mat and then um, somehow place your hands inside the finished bag and sort of uh, wax on, wax off. Um, and you might need to do that a few times, meaning you might need to remove the bag, heat up the, the space on the ironing board again, do it again. Uh, you might need to do it a third time, but um, the heat on the board really helps get everything nice and smooth. Imelda says, do you wash any of your bags or treat them with Scotch Guard? I personally don't just because I make so many and they're generally only getting used for a short period of time, but Scotch Guard is not a bad idea. Um, I do have a free video on my YouTube channel or my website sh talking about Scotch Guard, how to apply it. Um, washing the finished bags, that's a, also a great question. Um, the interfacings that you're using, especially the by Annie Soft and Stable, the foam interfacing, those can go in the washer or dryer. So um, if you'd like to, you can. Um, Pre-washing, I guess I should also mention pre-washing fabric. So I'm generally working with fabrics from manufacturers that I'm familiar with. So I'm familiar with the amount of shrinkage in general, usually um, with high quality quilt shop fabric. Shrinkage is very minimal. Um, I did a test years ago where I cut up an exact yard of fabric, measured it, put it in the washer, dryer, measured it again when it came out and I ironed it. Um, and the shrinkage was really, really small, maybe an eighth of an inch on each side. Um, if you're working with an unknown fabric or you would just like to pre-wash it, you'll just treat it the same way that you would with planning on washing and drying the finished bag. So putting in the washer, putting in the dryer, ironing your, your fabric flat because shrinkage can occur. And that's why I say if you're unsure of the provenance of your fabric, it's never a bad idea to uh, pre-wash it. Nan says, what type of clear vinyl do you use for bags? Um, I've used eight gauge and 12 gauge in the past. Um, thicker gauges are fine as well. And gauge means um, the thickness. So eight gauge would be thinner than 12 gauge. Um, I would not suggest using anything thinner than eight gauge because then you're getting quite thin and I would be concerned with um, sort of a hole appearing in the clear vinyl in the finished bag. Um, but um, clear vinyl can be used for anything from the entire bag, such as the Pinto Stadium bag or smaller portions, such as um, a little sleeve for an ID um, in the credit card section or wallet of the bag. 
Terry says, I've been successful ironing leather and vinyl with Teflon sheets. Oh, I have not had the pleasure of working with those before, but again, I'm going to write that down. That's a great tip. Thanks, Terry. Oh, great question, Sue. Sue wanted to know, any idea when you will be getting more hummingbird cork? Uh, we do have it on order. Uh, it hasn't shipped yet, so I don't have an expected uh, delivery, but we do get the cork really, really quickly after they ship it. So um, hopefully we'll be getting more shortly. We do have an out of stock notification on the website. So all you need to do is go to the product listing on our site and uh, an email notification box will pop up if it's out of stock and you can type in your email address. What that does is it will automatically notify you when um, I place the item back in stock. And if it's an item with <clears throat> sort of variants or different choices, such as the cork, it comes in two different sizes, you'll just need to select your size first and then the out of stock notification box will pop up after you've done that. <clears throat> Lisa says, hi, Sarah, I just got a Juki 2010Q, congratulations. And did you change your throat plate to a thicker plate or you just have your original on making your bags? That's a great question. With all of my Jukis, as soon as I got them, I changed out immediately to the throat plate for thicker fabric. What that is, since the Juki that I have is a straight stitch only machine, it doesn't have sort of an opening on the bottom where the needle goes through, meaning like a rectangular opening. So for machines that are not straight stitch, where you can move the needle back and forth, there's sort of a, a rectangular channel to accommodate the movement of the needle. With a straight stitch only machine, there's only a, a really small hole because the needle's only going in that one positioning. The throat plate for thicker fabric has a slightly larger hole than the plate that came with the machine. And after I replaced it, I just left it on. So I also use it for quilt blocks and uh, garment sewing haven't done garment sewing in a while, but yeah, I highly recommend that plate and you can just leave it on and um, store your original plate somewhere else. Debbie says, when you using a PUV material, for instance, in the lining of a lunch or cosmetic bag, could you still press the outer fabric? That's a great question, especially since there's interfacing layers in between. Um, you should be able to press it, granted, um, if you're exterior fabric is a pressable fabric, um, but I, I believe you should be able to press it. I've made a few lunch bags in the past with that type of fabric and um, I haven't had any problem with pressing on the exterior of the finished bag. Teresa says, <clears throat> please anyone who irons vinyl be careful not to let it get too hot. Burning PVC vinyl releases chlorine gas. Oh, I did not know that, but thank you for the, the note about that, Teresa. Cindy says, I was looking on the website for a template for the hobo bag, but couldn't find one. Do you have a template for this bag? We actually do not have an acrylic template for that bag, um, but I can definitely look into that. Let me write myself a note. Bag, acrylic. Do you have a pattern for a business card case? Um, I actually do not. Um, hmm. That's an interesting idea though. Got myself a note for that also. I'm not sure if you're looking for sort of a smaller zippered pouch style or if something more, maybe with credit card slots. Uh, feel free to email me after the show if you're looking for something specific and I'm, I'd be happy to take a look. Danny's gonna put my email address up on the screen right now so you have it. Yep, there's my email. Uh, feel free to email me after the show and um, if you have any questions, you can email me anytime. Are you calling in on the questions, Danny? Mm -hmm. All right, I apologize if I did not get to your question live, but I'll be back again next Sunday with Danny. Um, and next Sunday is also another segment of Bag Lab. Um, so one more thing to get to for the show tonight, and that is the giveaway. So the giveaway is randomly drawn out of all of the comments that are left on the show. We combine all the comments from Facebook and YouTube, and you have until the end of the day this Saturday to leave a comment on this show. And I have an extra question for you. Um, oh, by the way, the prize is an $88 gift certificate to my website, sosweetness.com. 
and I have an extra question to ask you for an extra method of entry. And my question is, what was your favorite candy as a kid? So let me know in the comments. My favorites were probably either Raisinets or Reese's Pieces, but let me know in the comments what your favorite candy was when you were a kid. And um, thank you so much for tuning in for Social Sunday. I hope you have a great week and happy sewing. Bye everyone. Thank you.